Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to From the Stands. I am Caleb, representing the fantastic state of Oklahoma and the Oklahoma Sooners. Joining me today, JJ and the Penn State Nittany Lions. What's going on, bud? Oh, not much, not much. It's been a while, guys. It's it been a while. Been. It's good to be back. It has been. It has been. And of course, Very we've got time. our glorious leader, Brian here repping the UCF. He's he reps UCF, but he's wearing an LSU shirt, and I'm not sure what's going on with that or why. <laughs> I mean, I guess yeah. I kind of get it because I mean, like, really, what store would sell UCF branded clothing? So I kind of I kind of understand it, but at the same time, like, he could have gone with something a little a closer to home or b like I mean, Bama's closer to Florida than LSU. No, no, can't can't be sporting Bama. Can't be sporting, but just won't do it. I don't blame you. I don't nah. blame you. Don't blame me at all. So let's uh, let's jump into this. We had a, a hell of a week of football uh, here in what is this week six, seven, eight? I don't even know anymore. Who really knows? Because COVID's all kind of got us all over the place. But I think it's I think it's week seven. We're going into yeah. week seven. It's, it's different for each conference, honestly. True, at this point, true. like they're, they're all on their own schedules. Yeah, this is I think for like the big in the SEC, this is like week five for yeah. the Sun Belt. this is like week eight it's crazy it's it's kind of crazy how just how spread out everything's gonna be i mean we don't even yeah. have the pack of the big starting yet um i'll be starting if you're baylor if you're baylor it's not even week three yet <laughs> true so, uh... if you're houston it's week one <laughs> houston is week one poor guys Oh, man. Uh, so we had a great week of football this week. I think the biggest uh, things this week, we had a couple of upsets, uh, which we're going to talk about here shortly. But uh, we did have a fantastic, probably in my opinion, uh, the best worst game of the year. Uh, and I say this completely unbiasedly, of course. Um, <laughs> the fourth overtime uh, OU Texas game, the, uh, the just... If you've ever wanted to watch two teams go against each other and try their absolute best to lose, this is the game for you. Classic. Boy, do we have a game for you. Classic Big 12 score. It just took us four extra, you know, drives each to get there. Uh, we're going to actually be talking a lot about that game here coming up shortly. But I want to hear from you guys really quickly. What was your favorite? What was your standout game uh, this week for you? Uh, I, I personally like the Clemson Miami game just because I was really, really tired of seeing people on social media saying, Oh, this game's gonna be close guys. It's going to be close. Miami is, they're like one, a one B in the ACC. Now the ACC is a good football conference. No, Clemson still can turn it on whenever they feel like it. They, it's like they played Virginia two weeks ago, kind of playing with their food a little bit. And then they came out and just punched Miami in the mouth. And that was kind of fun to watch. Not really a huge Clemson fan, but. Miami kind of rubs me the wrong way. I'm going to I'm gonna have to agree. I, well, I mean, I'm going to have to agree and disagree on some points there. Number one, um, I, I thought it was going to be a lot closer than it was. I did not expect Miami to get, you know, American History X curb stomped. All right. <laughs> uh, did not see that coming. Pun yeah. intended. Uh, so, that being said, I... I I'm just so sick of Clemson. And I'm sure, you know, I, that you're like, really an Oklahoma fan saying you're sick of Clemson? Yeah. So, but at the same time, I really thought Miami was going to give Clemson a run for their money. I wasn't going to say, you know, Miami will win or Clemson will win. I, you know, I, I thought it was, was going to be a 50-50 game. It turned into like a 90-10 very quickly. 50-50 um, yeah. game is a little bit aggressive, I think. <sighs> no, I, I did. I really <laughs> thought because of the climate and everything, COVID, the practices, you know, not having as big a yeah. season, you know, I thought there was a shot that Miami was going to be able to hold their own. I thought Miami was, you know, one or two, and I still think Miami is one or two in the conference. It's just, you know, it's the ACC. It's, it's Clemson and everybody else. It's basically yep. what the Big 12 was before this year. Right, it was Oklahoma and everybody else, and you know, the only difference is nobody could surprise Clemson once a year. Um, yeah, and so I mean, I think we can already put in a lock that uh, Clemson. I mean, Notre Dame's the only only obstacle left for Clemson, in my opinion, and it's not really much of an obstacle. It's kind of a bump in the road that's a little higher than average. Yeah. But uh, you know, unless they just hit that bump wrong and you know tear open their 
their oil pan, then Clemson's got a smooth sailing all the way to the, the college football playoff. And I don't think, I don't think other than Notre Dame, anyone's going to be able to, to jump in there and, and get involved with them. Um, especially yeah. after the showing they just showed uh, against Miami. Uh, what did you think, yeah. Brian? What was, uh, what was your standout game of the week? Yeah, I mean, there's a few. Obviously, the Clemson-Miami game, uh, like JJ brought up. Uh, I think the most interesting thing to me is the way that Clemson is using ATN. Um, clearly, they're trying to get him as many touches as possible. Um, he's a fantastic athlete. He's going to go very highly in the draft. But the entire first quarter, they kind of toyed with the Miami defense, uh, dumping passes to him in the backfield and just letting him do what he wanted. Um, I, th I think that's kind of why Miami stuck around for a little bit. Uh, and then they're like, all right, we're going to stop toying with them. Uh, Miami's, you know, only touchdown early was that blocked field goal, which was just, you know, a ridiculous call by Dabo to even <laughs> attempt that. But uh, yeah. No, it's whatever. Uh, I, I thought the Bama Ole Miss game was super interesting. Uh, something notable, that game was 14-14 with four minutes left in the second quarter. Both teams went on to score every single drive after that, not counting, you know, <laughs> kneeling out the time at the end of the halves. 13 straight scoring drives. So if you're watching that, you know, you got great entertainment out of that game. Yeah, it's, um, it's almost like uh, after LSU's win last year, the SEC was like, oh, shit, maybe we should play some Big 12 ball. Maybe we should we do the Big 12 thing. Because LSU did the Big 12, 12 thing just game? better than the Big 12. So if we can do Big 12 better than LSU, we win a natty. So now everyone's exactly. trying to do Big 12 play. It's great. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you see, you see really last week, I think the the SEC did a big, better job all the way around. <laughs> exactly. It, the SEC the Big 12 did. better than the Big 12. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, were there any other standout games you guys wanted to bring up before we jump into uh, some of our, you know, things leading into the next week? Uh, uh, I think I think it's worth mentioning that Jimbo Fisher finally won a game that meant literally yep. anything at Texas A&M. Um, <laughs> It, um, and they, they really were – they looked dead early in that third quarter, and they got a couple of turnovers and actually made some plays on defense, which, again, not something that can be said about the SEC as a whole for the majority of that day. Um, but they made a couple of defensive plays when it mattered. And yeah. Kellen Munn looked like good Kellen Munn, uh, but he'll probably play against Mississippi State this week and throw, like, complete, like, 40% of his passes or something because – I don't. I don't think anybody understands <laughs> what he is anymore at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, give them props. That was a good win. I think it did expose that Florida is not on Bama's level either. Yeah. Like people were saying after, you know, Florida looked solid offensively the first couple of weeks. That defense, even though Bama's defense looked bad against Lane Kiffin, their offense also looks better than Florida's offense. Yeah. I have a friend of mine that's a that's a really big Florida fan, and uh, he was actually at a wedding, not watching the game. Uh, and I, I texted him after the game. I was like, you know, you're just being a being an asshole. Like, hey, are you okay? Yeah. I just saw the score. <laughs> you know, are you okay? I haven't heard from you in a while. You know, uh, and he finally, I guess, he got done with his wedding, and it's like, I, he he just basically was like, I know, leave me alone. Um, <laughs> And uh, he was like, our defense is trash. I don't know what we're doing. And I was like, welcome to my hell every week. <laughs> um, but it's ironic, though, actually, that, you know, I'm not going to say that it was a great defensive showing by any stretch of the imagination in the OU Texas game. But there were like six picks, six sacks. Like there were a lot of defensive yeah. plays in that game. It's just like all the other plays in between were trash. But yeah. every once in a while, there was like this bright, you know, flash of like, you know, defense. It was crazy. It was it was a fun game. Uh, that being said, we're going to talk a little bit more about this OU Texas game as we get into our first topic of the week. It's going to be officially official, terrible officiating. All right. Uh, so this week we saw one of the most, I think, egregious. Um, I'm going to go to this screen really quickly here. Uh, 
one of the most egregious things I think perhaps we've ever actually seen. I'll get us back on. Here's our lovely faces again. Um, that we saw here, and I, I'm reading this on CBSSports.com just because, you know, while I'm producing, I like to have notes, and I didn't have time to do notes. So we're just going to read articles. Um, but basically, what brought on this is that officials can sometimes be like a third team, right? Everyone makes the jokes and the memes and things like that, but it actually kind of is a thing. Um, and the reason being is that the, the referees, the officiating team, has a lot of control over a lot of things, including clock management. And this week we saw a very egregious error in clock management. The Big 12 Conference um, officials people did come out and say, yes, this was a mistake. But for those of you who aren't aware of it, let me break it down very quickly for you, okay? So this mistake, and this is directly from CBSSports.com. I want to give credit where credit's due here. It says, the mistake took place just past the six-minute mark of the fourth quarter. Longhorns quarterback Sam Ellinger took off running on a third and four play inside of their own 20-yard line. He was initially ruled as a first down, but after a lengthy review process, uh, the call was overturned, and they marked Ellinger short. Um, it also incorrectly put back 40 seconds on the game clock. Instead of the clock restarting at 5.57, <laughs> where it was supposed to, where Ellinger had gone down, at the 5 minute 57 second mark, the referees decided that the clock needed to be set to 6 minutes and 36 seconds. That is an additional 40 seconds of time. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, <laughs> you may be thinking to yourself, okay? Uh, well, it's just 40 seconds. Well, the game was tied by a last minute touchdown drive by Texas, and they got the touchdown at 14 seconds left on the clock. So if you take away the 40 seconds, there's no need for overtime. Texas didn't score. Now, of course, obviously the game, the pacing, things would have been different. Um, right. You know, also it could have, if, if the ruling was never overturned, chances are Texas would have run it on a first and 10, right? Instead of a fourth and four, uh, where he attempted to pass the ball. Uh, which resulted in an interception. You could argue, well, if, the, if it would have been first and 10, they would have run it. The interception wouldn't have been thrown, and they potentially probably would have scored on that drive anyway, and it, would have made, uh, it wouldn't have made a difference. But in my opinion, and this is honestly unbiased, and I think you guys would agree, um, it's, it's <laughs> still in it. No, I'm, I mean about what I'm going to stay, say, not okay. the, about my <laughs> biasness here. Nah. Let's want to straighten that out um i think 40 <laughs> seconds is a is a pretty big error there's only 15 minutes in a quarter i mean 40 seconds is like four percent of a quarter like yeah. 40 right. seconds is not a small amount of time uh i think if you go back and and you kind of even just on, on not on a non-scientific level where you're like literally sitting there and going through game after game after game. But if you just watch your average game, I think at, at, at the two minute warning, right in that, that two minute speed offense that people try and do when they're, they're catching up to the game, you can put five up to five to six plays in 40 seconds of time. Oh yeah. Easy. Easily, yeah. Easy. I mean, there's teams that get up to, uh, you know, up to into the double digits of plays in 40 seconds if done properly. And so 40 seconds is a lot of time. I think that's an egregious error. Of course, Oklahoma went on to win the game. People are like, well, it's not that big of a deal. It didn't it may matter this way, but it did matter. And it does matter because instead of playing 60 minutes of football, not including overtime, we played 60 minutes and 40 seconds of football. Yeah. And you remember on that last Oklahoma drive before Texas got the ball back, it was a very, a lot of people were talking very, interesting call by Lincoln Riley to throw the ball on third and nine. You take 40 seconds off the clock there. He's probably running it, running out that extra 40 seconds. Absolutely. And you're talking about even less time. Absolutely. But now you're talking where was about two minutes left when they got, when he was making that decision, it made it a little bit tougher of a call. You say one minute, 20 seconds left. Yeah. I'll give him the ball at 40 seconds on the two yard line. No timeouts compared to a minute 30, which is what they had makes a huge difference it's, it's good that oklahoma won the game because that's that was a huge huge gap yeah I, I think if oklahoma had lost this game it would have been a much bigger deal than it yeah, ended yeah, up being 
Uh, because this was not a, an error that resulted directly in the loss of a team, one team or another. I mean, you could say it did or didn't because, I mean, again, they had to pass it on fourth and four, and he threw the interception. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that goes back into when they reviewed the play. This this would have never happened if they didn't review the play. Um, Speaking of, you know, bad officiating call making – or breaking a game, the Arkansas Auburn game this week, that was an officiating call that directly led to Arkansas losing that, that is football true. game. Yeah. That was Tell us about that most... call. Yeah, so Auburn was driving down the field. They get the ball to about I think they're about the nineteen yard line. Third and one. Bo Nix goes to spike the ball. He fumbles the snap and then tries to spike it behind him. Now you would think that's a fumble. So best case scenario for Auburn, they recover it and rush the field goal unit out onto the field with 15 seconds left to try to rush a field goal. But the referees call this backward pass intentional grounding, which only loses them three yards. It stops the clock and allows Auburn to kick a game-winning 39-yard field goal with four seconds left by the time the field goal is done. So totally awful for Arkansas who finally got off their SEC losing streak last week against Mississippi State had a chance to pull up back to back top 25 upsets if it wasn't for the referees stepping in and yeah. just forgetting what a fumble is that's literally what happened they forgot what constitutes a fumble so and Arkansas recovered it right no oh. Auburn Bo Nix recovered it but it didn't they didn't rule it a fumble in the first place they ruled it an intentional grounding either way the clock probably would have ran out before Auburn could have kicked the field goal because it was fourth down. So it's not like they could get back on the ball and spike it again. Auburn would have had to rush their field goal unit out to either kick a field goal with their field goal unit or try to run a play to get a first down and then stop the clock again. In all likelihood, Auburn's not going to score any points out of that yeah. if it's well, ruled co- correctly, which means Arkansas wins 28-27. Arkansas did actually end up recovering it. Oh, did um, they? Yeah, yeah. I, think th- I think that's the biggest issue. The, the um, entire the entire play was ins- pretty much insane, um, starting from, like, what happened all the way down to, you know, the day later when the SEC commented on it. But after he, after Nick spiked it, he uh, the close rep, th- you know, just kind of gently threw a flag on the ground, and Nick's immediate reaction was to go and argue with the rep over the, over the flag. And I think that was part of their, their argument that the play stopped, which is why they blew the whistle. The the entire explanation from the referees on the field was ridiculous. Was terrible. They 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 said that basically too many players stopped playing for the ball to be live <laughs> and not an immediate recovery. But I watched the play over, I don't know, maybe twenty times in slow mo. There's I, I can't tell where it came from, but uh, outside the box, probably a linebacker. 10 yards away from the ball, the second it takes a bounce behind Knicks, he's going after the ball. And then yeah. you see a lineman go after it. Then you see an Auburn player go after it. All within, played in real time, you know, two seconds. That's about as immediate as you can get, to me at least. So, yeah. Especially with the reaction time of, of an athlete that's trained to oh, do yeah. that. Right. So and, and, and regardless of whether or not, regardless of whether or not, Arkansas recovered it too. They still re- ruled it intentional grounding. So just because they stopped playing, you would think that you know they would just rule them down or was they still called it intentional grounding, which is just baffling to me yeah. how you can make that mistake. Yeah. Um, and then uh, do you have a, an example of some officially official bad officiating for us there, Brian? No. So I thought uh, JJ was going for an yeah. Auburn, sorry, Kentucky, I was just, it was, it was Auburn, too Kentucky. easy of a trans. It was too easy of a transition. I mean, I can. So That's I mean, okay. you, you no, no, no. Argue, go for it. You, you could argue that Auburn could be zero and three right now if it wasn't for the officials, because they also had a really bad, a really bad call go in their favor against Kentucky at the end of the first half. Kentucky was down eight to seven. They got first and goal to two. They're running back seemingly clearly to everybody including the announcers broke the plane and was in the end zone um they put the score graphic up and everything and then the official after wanting to put his hands up decides to mark it down at the half yard line they review it still put him down at the half yard line two plays later kentucky throws an interception and they only score six points the rest of the game so and kentucky would have got the ball after half so they could have been up a touchdown getting the ball back totally different game yeah. 
if that if that play is called correctly. So I mean uh, that one has to sting as well. So he said Auburn could very easily, you know, if the refs call it correctly, be 0 three right now. Instead, they're two and one and they're still ranked. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. And just in terms of refs in general, I was kind of I mean because obviously we see this if people joke about the Pac-12 pretty much yearly, uh, they're refereeing. Um, but I, I thought, think every you know, conference thinks that their refs are the worst refs. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a right. Big Twelve guy, Big Twelve refs are terrible. <laughs> all right, that that could be. So <laughs> I, I was, I thought, you know, maybe the whole, all this COVID protocol is, you know, throwing throwing things into whack. And it, they did say that um, regular season, there's eight eight on the field, uh, eight refs per game, and they dropped that down to seven. I guess for travel issues, or maybe they're yeah. just short. People didn't want to travel for health reasons. Yeah. Um, so they're down to seven. I don't. I don't think that should change very much. But I did notice uh, in the Big Twelve, they had they lost four of their top officials, uh, their head refs, which to me is seems like a lot. Uh, three retired, one left for the Big Ten. Um, if Assuming everyone's playing in your division, you got that's five Big Twelve games, and you just lost, you know, four of those five head refs. That I I can kind of see why things like the Texas Oklahoma game uh, fiasco could happen. You know, it's but it's amazing because if only there was you know another sports league that folded very quickly but had really <laughs> great officiating, um, and I mean did it with an Xbox controller. Um, mm. In a you know in an in an area where they had all the games on at the same time and whenever there was an officiating discussion going on they would say oh let's take a look at this discussion here and let's make sure the referees are understanding and following the rules correctly uh, let's take a look at everything oh nope that seems wrong hold on let me call them hey that's fucking wrong here's the correct way to do it and then. If it's something really questionable, you come on the air and you say, hey, let me explain this to you guys that are watching, okay? This is the rule. Yep. This is what it has to be. Sometimes there are things in the rule that we can't do or, you know, that it may seem obvious and is obvious after the fact, but we can't make rulings based on that because of this, this, you know, if only there was a sports league that would do that and, you know, perhaps <laughs> other to, leagues yeah. could then take those really awesome officiating things and you know use those uh in their own games especially since how much can an xbox one really cost <laughs> you know apparently they can do it with just an xbox so i don't i mean if i i will personally uh call the big 12 refs and say hey i will buy your xbox one if you will quit the shit like you got to assume that they know how to use it though too. But... I'll even use it for you. <laughs> you got to yeah, assume and, and that, that. And that was yeah. Go ahead. I was just gonna say you got to assume also that the NCAA would want to take responsibility for this. <laughs> <which, laughs> true. That's true. <laughs> well, and that's, that's not that's gonna that would never happen. happen. That would never and, happen. And that's it's not with the XFL stuff too. It wasn't like they were slowing the game down too by needing to do that. It, they were faster. They were actually faster were than the guys on the field. I mean, every time yes. we have a touchdown, the Oklahoma Texas game went on for damn near five hours. The average football <laughs> game is three, yeah. maybe three and a half. Was, it, was that on? Uh, was that on CBS? <laughs> Should have been. I, I think it was yeah. on CBS. I, I don't know. I think it was on. Uh, no, it was on Fox because it, it was on the, Fox. It was the big noon yeah. kick. The big noon kickoff. B and K that went into the halftime of the three thirty games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, my my question is, and we got to be brief because you know time is of the essence here. But uh, what, yeah. like, I I kind of jokingly said it, but I I really do think there's something there, right? Uh, the XFL did a really good job of having a central system, and I think each conference could do this on their own, uh, having a central system with a central reviewer who. Yeah had the rule book literally right next to him and could, you know, see previous calls and things like that and could watch the, the things from various angles and all sorts of just information. And if there was a call that was questionable, the referees on the field could call and say, Hey, we need some help figuring this one out. What are we, what are we supposed to do here? Or the coaches, for example, had the same are ability. Saying, 
Are you are you saying a single person that does this for say like all the Big Twelve games yeah. going on that week yeah. or yeah. one per game? No, that one one okay, central. I mean, you. I mean, you would treat it like like sort of. I guess the XFL did did it that way, but they only had two games going on at one time. Um, but I mean, even if you split right. it up into you know two people cover. I mean, you can cover multiple games. You're not gonna have to yeah, review. A, I mean, in the off chance that you have two reviews at the same time, you just pause the game and let the network make some advertisement money. You know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know how many crossover fans we're going to have, but for anyone that watches the NHL, anything, you know, super questionable, refs will take a look at it. If they can't make a decision, they send it to Toronto, where, I mean, they probably mm-hmm. just put all their best guys in one room who know the rule book, you yep. know, backwards, forwards. So it's easily doable. But, I mean, it is, have, it, is, it is, it is, it is, in my opinion, uh, the year 2020 for as many faults as it has, we, we should be well beyond uh, having referees make such an egregious mistake as to add and it basically an entire minute to the game. Right. Like, yeah, especially when that. it gets called 100%. out, Lincoln Riley says, Hey, we told them. And they were like, nah, it's fine. Nah, it's fine. It's, <laughs> everything is fine. Maybe someone just hit the Buffalo Buffalo Wild Wings button. I, I guess I don't know. Probably. Yeah. I don't know. But that's my question to you guys, really quickly. Like JJ, what 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 needs to change? What can the what can we do as 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 a, as football conferences? Because we are we obviously are that. Uh, what what can they do uh, to help and stymie this situation uh, and get this refereeing under control? I 100 percent think that you follow the XFL model at this point. I mean, I know we, we kind of laid it out here, but you, there are people at home. We, we talked about, I mean, the, the officiating overshadowed some of the bigger games of the weekend. Mm-hmm. And instead of, instead of people not understanding, and some of the calls may have been right, some of them may have been wrong, but people don't understand and they're not clarified until the next day. Yeah. And, the, and a lot of people aren't going to see that press release and everything else. I think the biggest thing is if you're going to make a call, you need to at least have someone that's able to explain it to the audience as they're watching it. Yeah. Like if you can, if you have, so that was one thing that the XFL did very well was you had someone in the booth talking to the commentator and saying, Hey, this is, this is what happened. This, because I was directly involved with it. Not just some retired official that comes yeah. in and says, this is probably what they're it's talking always, about. And it's always no, probably, it's, it's never the definitive. Made the decision. Yes. It's always, well, I think that they're going to do this because that's what I would do. Well, you, yeah. you made mistakes too. Exactly. So, yeah, so we want to hear from the person that's actually making the decision and yeah. say this is this was our exact thought process. This is what happened. Especially, it doesn't need to be on every call. It doesn't need to be on every review, but on ones that even the commentators are saying, "Wow, this is this is a tough one." Yeah, we should get some clarification on you know what's going on, and I think that would also help catch some of the issues that are happening yeah. as well. If you're being held accountable on air, like you could have a commentator be like, hey, "What happened to those forty seconds?" It's like, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. <laughs> all right uh brian do you have anything to add what do you what do you think uh we could do here no i mean i i agree the xfl model worked great i think if they can get that entire league together and have someone learn the rule book within a three to six month period to where i i don't remember i watched most of the games during the xfl season obviously we were doing the show mm-hmm. i don't remember them making many if any at all officiating mistakes that were like major i mean there there were but i think number one they were corrected or uh explained and like ref like referees were were had a meeting after every game to talk about what happened and and how they can do it better so i think there were there were small mistakes but you're right there were no egregious mistakes there was no no time when someone added a whole fucking minute to a game (laughs) yeah so if, if they can do that in that short of period of time, I feel like the, these conferences, all the money, all the experience behind them can, you know, figure something out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, with that being said, we, the three of us, are going to take a short break here. Before we do, I want to make sure we mention, uh, if you've been paying attention to the show, if you look up there in the top right corner of your screen, there are links to all of our social media platforms. That includes Facebook, our website, Twitter. Uh, I think there's even possibly an Instagram. Is there an Instagram? No, no TikTok we should, either. We should, get, we should get on the TikTok thing. <laughs> we should we should get on the TikTok thing for sure. 
Um, but guys, go check us out on all of our various social media platforms. We're on all the most popular ones, so uh, Facebook and Twitter for sure. Get out there as well as our Patreon. Uh, be sure to support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash from the stands. We are going to check in now for our British Blazer update with Cam, who unfortunately can't be on the show live anymore due to real life issues and the fact that, you know, we're 18 hours apart. But here's Cam with the <laughs> British Blazer update. Hello there. I'm Cameron, otherwise known as the British Blazer, and this week UAB are back in action meaning I get to bring you another From the Stands British Blazer update. Alright, this week the Blazers play Western Kentucky in Birmingham at Legion Field. And you know that when we play at home, we have to mention that the Blazers are undefeated in 20 straight games in Birmingham and looking to make it 21 against the Hilltoppers. But how do we do that? Last year, WKU defeated the Blazers 20-13 in Bowling Green. It rhymes, it's not fun. One of only six defeats in conference play since the program's re-inception in 2017. Well, WKU are basically a 50-50 split in terms of passing and rushing. I did the math, it literally comes out of 50. Which is great news for us, because we've got the second best passing defense in terms of yards allowed. So shutting down the passing game should not be an issue, assuming we just do what we normally do. And then rushing-wise, they're not the greatest team in the world, really. They have averaged just 113 yards per game so far on the ground across their four games that they've played. They're 1-3. and three. Assuming we, you know, don't get complacent, this should be routine for us. Of course, we are coming off of a bye week which means mentally we may have relaxed a bit. We may have taken our foot off the gas pedal, even if we haven't meant to. Coach Bill Clark has said that the team has used the week to focus on a lot of game film and focusing on the fundamentals, which in my mind seems like a solid way to, you know, not put all your eggs in one basket and just make sure that you are sharp and ready for what WK you have to throw at us. Other things to touch on. Good news, UAB has received more votes in the AP and coaching polls for the top 25. I don't think we'll crack the top 25 until later in the season, much later, or if we beat Louisiana. The Raging Cajuns are currently ranked at number 21, and if we can get a victory against them, I think that will severely boost our chances of cracking the top 25. But that doesn't happen then you know i think it will have to go down to us winning the conference so that'll conclude this week's from the stands british blazer update i'll be back next week to review this game against western kentucky and preview the game against louisiana assuming covid does not rear its ugly head once again i'm cameron this is the from the stands british blazer update i'll see you next time all right so we are back right here the three of us uh thank you cam for uh the, the british blazer update i love the title <laughs> british british blazer update uh here we are we are in our next segment called chaos reigns the shades of 2007 um uh we've got the fantastic uh texas oklahoma graphic up there just because um you know they they may be texas fans but uh you know, they're feisty ones. They're feisty ones. Uh, so Chaos Reigns, guys, there have been a ton of upsets this season. Uh, I think we counted them before the show. JJ, how many were there this... How, how many have there been so far this season in the in the, the very early beginnings of the season? In just six weeks, we've had 11 ranked teams either lose to an unranked team or a team that was ranked below them. So almost two per week and we're missing about four conferences still that haven't played a game yet haven't played a single game and there's going to be a recency bias i think when the when the uh rankings for that come out so i think you're going to see a lot of like pack and big te big teams uh kind of inch their way into the 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 top 25 
and then be kind of pushed back down when they do lose. So I think you're going to see a little bit more. Uh, what? How many? What? How many did we say there were in the year 2007? For those that weren't alive in 2007 or watching football in 2007, uh, 2007 was just an, an incredibly extreme year of upsets. I think it was what was it? 53. Fifty. Yeah, I think we said fit. Or 59. 59. It was, I thought it was 52 or 53. Yeah, I thought it was, it was 53. 50s. But it, either way, somewhere between 52 and 59 times that a ranked team lost to an unranked or lower ranked team in the year 2007. I think uh, like 10 of them were ranked number two. Like it was like the, the it was the curse of being ranked number two that year. If you were ranked number two, you lost the next the next week. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think. The national championship ended up being, ironically, LSU versus Oklahoma um, that year, LSU taking the title. Um, and I just, I, I'm, I'm starting to get the feeling that this year might might be able to catch up and, and, and either match or beat or come really damn close to 2007 in terms of the number of upsets that we have. I mean, we're at 11 right now. And that's not even including like teams that are just on the cusp, right? Because there have been some teams that you know have had votes and then lost to some random person. I mean, the first uh, the first week of Big Twelve play, we saw Iowa State and Kansas State both lose to teams they had no business losing to. And then the very next week, and the week after, Kansas State and Iowa State <laughs> beat Oklahoma, who was the projected to win the Big Twelve. You know, and so and then uh, what was it? TCU beat Texas. Uh, that same week that Oklahoma uh, yep. lost to Iowa State. I mean, uh, we've seen, uh, who was it, uh, Texas A&M just took out Florida this past week. I mean, yep. you're seeing a ton, and it's not just like like lower tier guys, right? Like number six has fallen, number three has fallen, number nine has fallen. Uh, these are top ten teams that are being beaten just out of the blue, seemingly out of the blue. Uh Brian, I want to get your thoughts on why you think that is. Why is this year shaping up to be another 2007? Uh, and and the fans of Team Chaos uh, are are just overjoyed right now. Uh, why has Team Chaos reared its ugly head this season, do you think? Yes, I mean, I am a subscriber of Team Chaos. Uh, <laughs> always love it. I don't know if we'll get 2007 levels of it. But I, in my, in my head, you know, just looking at how things are unfolding, I think a, a big part of what's playing the role of 2020's chaos is that we don't really know where all these teams are supposed to be ranked right now with, you know, the Big Ten not starting yet, with the Pac-10 or Pac-12 not starting yet. Right now, I mean, and no hate to North Carolina. They're undefeated. They're playing pretty well. Um, I caught the second half of their game. They look like a decent squad. They're top five. At the, what are they, rank six? Top five or six? They're fifth. Yeah. Fifth. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing about, you know, their returning starters or what I've seen um, from the play last week or, you know, highlights. Um, and it's not like they've played anyone who's super good. Yeah, spectacular. Yeah, uh, I understand to this point so i don't know if they deserve that number five ranking but you know if they are that over over ranked right now no matter who they play it's going to look like a massive upset if they lose people say oh number five went down well i mean is north carolina really a number five right now i don't really know i don't know if anyone really knows so well i can tell you oklahoma was definitely not number five when they were number five uh, mm -hmm. i can tell you lsu was definitely not number six when they were level number six um Florida probably not, definitely not number three. While they were, th I mean, I think I think you're on to something there. I think you know with such a limited, uh, such a limited out of conference schedule. I mean, the Big Twelve played out of conference, and it I think royally screwed the Big Twelve in every way, shape, and form that they decided to do it because Iowa State and Kansas State lost uh, to both both the Sun Belt teams, right, including ULL, uh, which is now ranked. But there's no way that ULL stays ranked. <laughs> Uh, once the pack and big start playing, there's just no, I'm sorry. I love ULL and I wish on everything. I wish that ULL could stay ranked. It would be amazing. I just don't see it happening. Right. I just don't see it 
after the after the season's all said and done. Um, I'm not saying they're going to lose anything. I just think that ULL's not they're not going to have the strength of schedule. Um, but we don't know maybe. if maybe. if you know maybe I maybe the Sun Belt is just a massively overpowered conference right now. We'll never know because the only wins they have are to you know Iowa State and Kansas State. And even if they win, you know, go on to play in the Big 12 championship game, which is unlikely, but possible, uh, you know, then how, how do you judge that, right? All right. I think, I think it, we'll get into what I think. JJ, what do you think it is? What do you think is causing all of these, these, these chaos teams to, or these, this chaos team to, to be out on the field this year? So I think, I think, it's, I think it's a combination of two things. Um, I think there's a very large talent gap between the top you know, three teams, I'll say. I'll say Alabama, Clemson, and Ohio State, I think, are clearly more talented than everybody else. And everybody else is kind of more towards the middle. And some of those teams that are from, I'll even say from like four all the way to, to 40, aren't totally separated in talent. There's definitely a big difference between Georgia and Auburn. But I also think there's a big difference. I think you're seeing the biggest difference in coaching. Um, the teams that have solid coaching are able to formulate good game plans and take advantage of teams that, you know, they might be more talented, but if they're not as well coached, you know, they don't have the time to fix things. So you've got a team like, like LSU that's putting in all these new players. They might be really talented, but you gave them no prep. You dropped them right into a game against Mississippi State, debuting a brand new offense. And you dropped him in against – they got Vandy, which was nice. But then you dropped him in against Missouri. He was playing with a new quarterback. You had no film on him. So it's, you know, a lack of preparation, a lack of film, I think, is allowing some teams, you know, pull some tricks out of their bag and pull some upsets. So I think there's a chance that you might see it slow down a little bit as the season goes on if teams are able to get some film on other teams. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also don't think you're going to see the top two chaos that we had in 2007 True. where all those number twos lost – and you had number one and number two losing in the same week weekend three times. I don't think you see that because I think the talent gap between the top three, well, what will be the top three? Once Ohio State plays, they're going to move up to three. Um, but you, I mean, but you will they ta- though? But will they? Uh, I mean, who do you see? <laughs> the only I mean, team that I mean, has a chance to beat them is is us, and I don't think that's happening. So, I mean, I, I was actually looking at this this morning. Did you like Michigan has more? Uh, conference championships than Ohio State does, um, in in the Big Ten conference. Um, True. And, and while if you go I know, back to like yeah, 1865. No, well, the conference started in 1898 <laughs> or in 1897. I think yeah. so. It's not. You can't yeah. go that back that far. But the but the idea. What I'm saying. What I mean by that is, you know, even if you go within the past 50 years, I think it's pretty close uh, between Michigan and Ohio State. Well, well, I mean, you're saying that this year is coming more down to coaching than talent. I think it, unless you have the absolute elite level of talent, which I only think Alabama Clemson and Ohio state have, you need to have very, very good coaching because you have to be, especially early on in the season, you don't have games against FCS schools. You don't have games against, you know, a bunch of tune-up games before you get into important conference games. Yeah. You're jumping right into it. And you've got teams that with like, really smart coaches like Gary Patterson who knows Texas. He knows Texas. They will put a game plan together, and then you've got Texas who doesn't have any film on TCU on what they want to do. It makes it very. It makes it a lot easier for teams to pull an upset. I think that might go away a I mean, little bit as I was gonna, the season at, goes along. At the end of this, but, I was going to ask you, like, do you, realist, do you really think that Matt Campbell's a better coach than Lincoln Riley? Um, I'm not saying – I don't know if it – I don't know. I don't think he's a better coach. He might be better at getting the ta- getting what he ha- like getting everything he can out of the talent he has because obviously the talent disparity is there. True. Which in Oklahoma and Iowa State, um, and like I said, Oklahoma hadn't played had played a game against Kansas State, um, and Kansas State kind of gave him a blueprint. And Iowa State played a bad game against Louisiana, and then I think I forget which other Big Ten t- or Big Twelve team they played the week before that, or even if they did play anyone before that. Not a lot for Oklahoma to go on. Yeah, for that for that offense, and then things just you know everything just kind of spiraled from there. Well, my my theory on this uh, is that um, I think you had two camps uh, in the preseason. 
Um, I think you had the people who took COVID seriously and the people who basically said, you know, it, we're just going to practice. And if we, somebody gets COVID, they stop practicing, right? Um, places like Oklahoma, for example, did very limited practices. Barely any practice Sure. before the season started now obviously they had their cupcake game against arguably the absolute worst team that they could legally play um but even in that game you know there were some i mean you know even in that game there were some questionable decisions being made um and you know, there was obviously a lot of rust but i think you know we hope that because of that that easy game you could shake some of that off i think i think a lot of it has to come down to um Team, some teams practice, I think, more than others, and we're a little. I don't want to say careless because I don't want to get into a political argument over about what COVID mm-hmm. is and, and mm-hmm. all that stuff. But I just think that some some people practiced more than others, um, and I, I think that everyone tried to game plan as much as everybody else. But I think in terms of actual, you know, practicing one on one, that certain teams had had more opportunities to do that or took more opportunities to do that than others. I also think that because of the lack of the out of conference games, we're relying heavily, and I think that's was obviously seen uh, in the first four weeks of the AP, uh, where you know teams were dropping like crazy uh, games that they shouldn't have. Um, I think you said week three had six ranked teams fall, something crazy like that. Um, like you have, you're relying too much on last year's results results yeah and you know we've talked about this before in the off season you lose coaches you lose players you gain new players with different skills um you know you you have different game plans you have new coordinators there's so much that can change from season to season to season uh on your team and i think that because of that i think you have both the the fact that covid was around and teams weren't able to practice as much as they wanted or had to do things differently and in a different way than they're culturally used to uh on those campuses and then you had so much reliance on the previous year's uh rankings and you didn't True. have sort of those cupcake games that you always have uh or those you know the, every team pretty much plays like two cupcakes and like uh, someone decent right uh, sometimes someone good, but some at least someone decent, uh, unless you're Alabama, of course. Uh, but you 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 have before before the season really kicks off and you get into your conference play, it's a lot easier to see the skills ceilings and 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 bottoms of teams uh, because we have something to reference. And I think this year we didn't really have anything to reference, and so when you have conferences starting at different weeks and playing different numbers of games. And things like that, along with the COVID practicing situation, I think what you get is is a miss is this issue here where teams that we thought were going to be good aren't, and teams that we didn't think were going to do well uh, did really well because they practiced more, right? I think you know if you really got down to it, I think Iowa State. I know the Big Twelve had some pretty decent uh, COVID restrictions and policies and practices, um, and I think uh, ULL actually had three additional weeks of practice versus Iowa state. Um, and three weeks of practice makes a huge difference, especially when you're preparing for that game because ULL knew generally speaking, they knew they were going to be playing Iowa state. So they had time to prepare and they had three additional weeks to do it in terms of their players and being able to, you know, use the practicing squads and things like that to run plays as they thought they would. And Iowa Mm -hmm. state looks very similar to Iowa state last year. So, I think that situation kind of came into play, and that's why we're seeing as much as we are. Yeah, and I mean, this yeah. doesn't really tie into the chaos, but I think just on that note, uh, this could turn out really well for the Big Ten. Absolutely. Uh, starting later, because I, a big thing, obviously, when all the, all the COVID stuff got, I mean, it was always serious, but like when things started getting locked down, uh, was states all try to make, you know, their own rules about what could happen. In that time, these players weren't, you know, tr- even if they weren't practicing, they probably weren't even training together because, you know, you couldn't go out to, like, a public park and, you know, be seen in, in large groups. Yeah. The Big Ten 
now. Uh, like everything is pretty much open to where you can mm-hmm. could have at least been training. Yeah. So they're gonna have yeah. that extra month of training plus the practices. Uh, I, I think it could turn out really well uh, for them if we have bowl games yeah. and then obviously yeah. for for playoff hopes for sure. Yeah, they get sure. they're getting a tra- they're getting a traditional training camp. Yeah. Right. And the other schools didn't get that. And I do, right. yeah, I do think that's a big, big deal. I do think, it, and it does tie into the coaching thing too. I think you had to, not even that you had to be a good coach, you just needed to handle the situation in a way that set your players up correctly. And there was no way to know if you were going to be able to do that, right? There was well, nothing that, in your background that prepared you for something like this. You just had to, you know, kind of have the right formula that, you know, ended up working. It's kind of like a shot in the dark. And to that um, point, um, to that point, I think there was a quote by Lincoln Riley very early on in the COVID situation. He said, my, my player's safety is more important to me than winning a game. Um, and if, if, yeah. if, if we have to stop practicing, we just stop practicing and, and we'll figure it out as we go. Versus like, and, and you've got Oklahoma now two and two on the season. And they were, they were, you know, preseason ranked number five coming off of two back-to-back, you know, uh, playoff appearances and three Heisman finalists and two winners. So then you've got like Oklahoma State, Mike Gundy. If you've been watching the ESPN uh, film on Mike yeah. Gundy, Mike Gundy is all about those practices. He's like, we're going to get in here and we're going to practice, <laughs> right? If you have COVID, you have COVID, stay home. But everybody else better show their ass up to work. Yeah. Um, and he is running the Big 12. So, I mean, it, it, there's two philosophies. And I think that, you know, the fortunate thing is that no matter who wins this national championship or what season kind of season you have everybody's season is going to have an asterisk next to it um and and the history books will look at this season as <laughs> as just hopefully a really fun season in my opinion so you're just you're just prepping for an oklahoma state wins the conference and makes oh the no uh, no, no, no 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 that no, you listen. don't want it to count <laughs> no no if texas were were still winning yes but Oklahoma State, no, it's fine. Uh, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State's due for a Big Twelve win. They really are. You know, fuck Texas, but Oklahoma State, we'll give them one every once in a while. They deserve it. You know, uh, somebody's got to somebody's got to be the little brother here. Um, but that being said, I think another point to raise that I, I should have raised when I was talking about my COVID stuff is every every week your roster's changing at this point. Like, oh, yeah. literally, you have rosters being changed because of COVID and contact tracing. Your entire starting offensive line can be out for a game all of a sudden. Um, just because one of the linemen got it and they were in the lineman room doing, you know, film review. Now everyone in that room has to sit out the game. Um, and Which... so I think you're getting different teams and different looks every single week from some teams, not all teams. But it's, it's definitely a possibility that your team this week is going to look different than that. I think OU's a, a fantastic example, but not for COVID reasons, but marijuana reasons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, after the bye week this week, we get nine players back that have been suspended for the first nine weeks, uh, six of which are starters. So uh, you're going to see a completely different Oklahoma team come out of the come out of the gate. Um, I, think, I think we play TCU next after the bye game. So... You know, and then that goes back to Gary Patterson. How is he going to, how is he, he has no film on half of these guys from this year. Yeah. How is he going to be able to prepare for that? So I, I definitely get what you guys are saying. We've got about a little under 10 minutes left. We need to jump into our shots and chasers. Anything to finalize this uh, COVID or this uh, chaos reigns discussion? Or are you guys good to move I, on? Just, just one last very quick thing is you make a good point about, you know, people being out. Imagine if Alabama's wide receiver core just all gets taken out for like their game even against like tennessee or something how's the Mm -hmm. playoff committee going to look at something like that because that's something that could come into play if you just kind of throw that game out because you know a very important part of their offense just got scrapped the week of the game there's so much more to this that we don't know yet that of how this season is going to play out i I mean it's going to be kind of upsetting to some degree but it's going to be interesting as well all right anything uh from you brian are you good to move on no, maybe just uh, it'll be interesting to see how Saban is coaching over That's the true. weekend. That's true. Maybe Saban. they'll have him on. A, Nick him Saban on a, just yeah. just before the show, it came out. Nick Saban's been uh, got the COVID. He's got the yeah, big maybe, CO. Maybe put him on, you know, FaceTime. Put him on a little Roomba on the sideline. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Little laptop on a Roomba, just running around. 
All right, let's go into our shots and chasers. If you guys don't know what shots and chasers are, this is basically your roadmap to game day where we're going to tell you what the most interesting games and in Jeff's opinion are. Jeff is our one of our data analysts here on the show and also a host from time to time. Uh, he comes up with these lists, and basically these are what we statistically think are going to be the most entertaining games of the week. So if your team is not playing at any particular time, these are the games we think you should watch. The shot is the primary game. The chaser is what you go to when they go on one of those needless commercial breaks. So, <laughs> starting out at 12 o'clock Eastern for our shot this week, we have South Carolina versus Auburn. What are you thinking on this one, uh, Brian? Let's go with Brian on this one. Yeah, I mean, like JJ said earlier, Auburn could be 0-3 right now. Um, so I'm not really sure what kind of game this is going to be for them. South Carolina, South, South Carolina's defense I kind of like. Um, it's kind of a weird thing to say with how the SEC has been going this year with all the points scoring. Like you said, I think it ranks like a mini Big 12, basically. Um, but South Carolina's defense uh, I kind of like. Um so I'm not going to say I'm going to root for South Carolina in this game just because of the travesty uh, suffered at the hands of Arkansas this past weekend. Um, but I, I kind of like Arkansas in this game uh, okay. just because of Auburn's uncertainty. So. All right, so you're going, uh, who, who's, who wins this one? I think South Carolina wins South this Carolina? straight up. All right, JJ, South Carolina or Auburn? Uh, South Carolina, same things you basically just said. I think Auburn is pretty fraudulent at this point. Uh, I think they're going to start to get exposed down the stretch here. All right. Um, I'm going to also go with South Carolina. I think they got that big win last year versus Georgia and upset Georgia. So uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll see something else again. I know it's not probably not going to be an upset, but I do think South Carolina is a little bit of an underrated team uh, in the SEC West. Uh, moving on to our chaser very quickly here. Eastern Carolina versus Navies, and somehow Navies ending up playing on ESPN+. Plus. Not sure how much sense that makes, but uh, just historically speaking here, I think that uh, the Navy have already beaten the Pirates uh, in the real world, and I think that we're going to see that on the football <laughs> field as well. So I'm going to go with Navy. What do you think in JJ, Navy, or ECU? Uh, I think ECU is a little bit underrated. I mean, I know South Florida is terrible but eastern carolina east carolina took them to the, the woodshed last week um which was pretty impressive and navy is volatile i don't know what you're going to get out of them each week um maybe they're starting to settle in now maybe it was covid related but that beat down they took against byu was scaring me away a little bit here i think east carolina pulls up with mine so we're losing we're losing jj a little bit there it's all right we'll uh we'll move on hopefully he'll jj will get back to us here shortly uh, it looks like he's coming oh, back so now. You hear me? Yeah, you're cutting out a little bit. Right, where did I where did I where, where did uh, I cut out at? East, I just I think East Carolina pulls a minor upset. All right, we'll go with that. Uh, JJ or uh, Brian, ECU or Navy, real quick. Yeah, I'm going ECU. I don't even think I would call it an upset. Um, I watch probably obviously because of UCF more of the more of our AAC games uh, than most people. Uh, Ellers at quarterback for ECU is, is pretty damn good, and their offense is pretty potent. Uh, like JJ said, uh, the BYU game, Navy got thrashed, uh, and notably they also got thrashed by Air Force, uh, forty to seven. So, I I don't trust this <laughs> this Navy team to put together a, a full game against a, an ECU team that's that's pretty decent. All right, so we're gonna disagree on that one. Moving on to our three thirty Eastern time zone. A little under one minute left to go here. Arkansas, Ole Miss, JJ, who do you got? Oh, JJ's gone again. Brian, who do you got, Arkansas or Ole Miss? Yeah, um, besides Alabama, Georgia, which is game of the week, uh, obviously we'll talk about that probably. Maybe mini spoiler. Um, this is probably going to be the game that I watched the closest. Uh, I hated Felipe Franks at Florida. I just think he was not a great quarterback at all um, but he's had a pretty few decent weeks uh Ole Miss that Lane Kiffin offense against Alabama was surprisingly good um I don't know if Alabama's defense got exposed or you know Lane just pulled out the plays that Alabama wasn't ready for so I I think that's going to be an interesting one um either Ole Miss is going to absolutely blow them out or we're going to see a really good 
uh, mid-pack SEC game there. You say I'll, mid-pack. I'll... I think Ole Miss comes in number two in the SEC. Calling it now. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Wake Forest versus Virginia. Oh, wait, well, who do you got? Uh, Arkansas or Ole Miss, uh, Brian? Uh, officially. Take, take it. I'll take Ole Miss. Ole Miss. JJ, yeah. Arkansas yeah. or Ole Miss? Um, I think... I think it's going to be Ole Miss. If it's a low-scoring game, it'll be Arkansas. If it's high-scoring, it'll be Ole Miss. Well, I'm going to go with high-scoring. I'm going to say it's going to be Ole Miss. Uh, JJ, tell us about, uh, very quickly, Wake Forest versus Virginia. Oh, there's not a lot to, to say about this one. These are two teams. Big, uh, Virginia's going to take a step back, is taking a step back this year because you know they lost a lot from the team that made it to the championship game last year in the ACC. And Wake Forest is Wake Forest. Um, I don't think this is... Uh, 330 time slot in general is not great. This isn't gonna. Be, this is gonna be a close game between two not very good teams. Um, I think I'll just take the home team in Wake Forest. Wake Forest. Who do you got, Brian? Yeah, uh, personally, I I don't know which team should be favored here or which team I even uh, like. Um, Virginia's running. Did game. I cut out again? Yes, you did. Sorry about that. Yeah, I just I think I'd take Wake Forest. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we got you back now. Yeah. Um, Virginia's running game. I, I like that the kid uh, Tulapapa, um, but I, I don't know. I think this is just going to be one of those games that's just an absolute slog, probably pretty low scoring, um, and I don't think it's going to be interesting enough for me to watch. <laughs> well, I'll, apparently I'll, Jeff I'll take... sees something that we don't because he he's <laughs> the one that chooses these. I'm sure the slate wasn't <laughs> that great, but uh, I think uh, I think Virginia with a new logo, you know, new year. Uh, new terrible season. I think Wake Forest takes this one off of Virginia as well. Uh, what's your final pick on that one, Brian? I didn't ca- quite catch that. Uh, probably Virginia. Virginia. All right. Yeah. And in our seven thirty time slot for the shot, the game of the week, we do have Alabama versus Georgia. Uh, this one I think is interesting only because I was actually hoping for the sake of my friend to have an undefeated Georgia coming in with an undefeated Florida for the Florida Georgia game. But of course we're not going to see that because of Florida. I also don't think Georgia has the capability to beat Alabama this year. Um, I think that uh, Georgia is uh, probably ranked about 10 spots higher than they really should be. Uh, And uh, I think this week they're going to get exposed. Of course, it'll be a quality loss to Alabama, so they won't drop too far in the rankings matter of fact they may even move up into the number three spot where florida was just because uh jj what do you think about uh alabama georgia going on here so i kind of agree and disagree with you i don't think georgia is overrated i just think that there's a bigger gap than people are realizing again between the top three teams and everybody else georgia might be the a top five team but compared to alabama they are not even close i think alabama makes a clemson like statement and wins going that's away big. here um but it doesn't i don't think that's an indictment on georgia i think they're still a top five team they could be the what oklahoma was last year and be the sacrificial fourth seed this year but so uh, sick I, of yeah. being that sacrificial fourth seed it's really getting <laughs> it's really i'm kind of glad in a way I've, I've talked to i you know obviously all my family is is very big oklahoma fans i talk to them you know i say you know what i'm kind of glad we're not making yeah. the playoffs this year because it's like I just want a nice bowl game, you know. That's, yeah. You know, that's fine. Uh, what are you? What are your thoughts on Alabama, Georgia, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I I gotta go against the pack here. Um, oh. I I, I kind of like Georgia in this game, based on how Lane Kiffin was able to easily expose this Alabama defense. I think had Georgia not discovered that uh, Dewan Mathis was not the pick for them at quarterback so early and switch to sets and Bennett Alabama probably runs away with this game despite Georgia's defense being uh, a pretty top tier or looking top tier so far um, but Stetson Bennett has been pretty productive and he's making good decisions on the field um, and that's how you beat a team like Alabama this is a really talented Alabama team I mean t- top to bottom they look really good Najee Harris is on fire. Obviously, like we talked about earlier, the receiving core is insane, obviously. Um, and I I think Georgia can take this one. I really wish the spread was a little bit higher 
because I would I would put a lot of money on this game. It's sitting at uh, Alabama minus four right now. Mm. Um, yeah, which is interesting. It was it seven. Nick Saban being out. Yeah, the yeah, line, three that, points. yeah. I can see that. Really? Um, I do, okay. I can and can't. Like I can see why Vegas would say that, but also it's Nick I don't Saban. Think he's worth so three points. Nick Saban is is definitely still on that sideline on multiple monitors with multiple oh, yeah. views. Uh, with, you know, headphones in every player's ears so that he can scream at them virtually. Uh, he's definitely <laughs> there. Um, and and I think I don't, I don't think his presence on the field is going to be missed nearly as much as Vegas thinks it will be. Um, that being said, uh, so you're going to go, so we've got one Alabama, one Georgia. I am going to go with the what the analytics tell me, as they say in the NFL, and the analytics tell me that Alabama is going to win this game. Very quickly, just to wrap up the show here, UTEP versus Southern Miss. What do you got for us, JJ, with a pick? Um, I'm going to go with Southern Miss. And neither team's really great, but Southern Miss started to get into a groove the last week or week or two um, after a rough start. I think UTEP is one of the bottom feeders of the FBS. I think it's always pretty safe to fade them. <laughs> All right. And, yeah. uh, Brian, what do you got? UTEP, Southern Miss. Yeah, I agree. Um, UTEP, obviously never, at least recently, a great team. Southern Miss has been okay. They, I mean, they're 1-3, and three, and ESPN, uh, you know, their their matchup predictor has them at a 72% chance of winning this game. Um, it, if you're only 27% win, win probability against a 1-3 and three team, uh, you're probably not that great. So I'm, I'm just going with USM here. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go with the miners just because uh, I feel like okay. chaos reigns this week somewhere, and this may be the game for it. Uh, that being said, we are gonna end the show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We're gonna end the show with our world class and famous Pac-12 seconds from uh, myself, Caleb, JJ, and Brian. We will see you all next week.